Hello, I am here with Dr. Rick Bozhart today. And Rick, you reached out to me to talk about how some of these DEI or social justice initiatives are impacting the field of medicine and specifically surgery. And this is this is it's it's interesting. It's extremely concerning that these sorts of initiatives are impacting hard sciences and especially when it comes to patient care and where you really want the evidence base to be very strong. And I'm curious to hear more about your experience with this and what your concerns are. Can you start by telling a little bit about yourself and your background? Yes, and uh, Leslie, thank you for having me. I, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, I really do appreciate having a platform anywhere, anytime to get this message out that I think is so important. Um, I'm a nobody. I really am. I'm just a, a community surgeon in uh, Tavares, Florida, a small town in central Florida. Been in practice for going on 35 years, approaching retirement. Uh, I'm a plastic surgeon by specialization, board certified by the American Board of Plastic Surgery. And throughout the, almost the entirety of my career, I had been um, a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. And to provide a little background, because people really don't know what that means, um, a fellow in the ACS is basically a surgeon who has met the requirements for um, membership. And those requirements are relatively strict. They require that other members uh, recommend you. Uh, you have to be vetted through your practice experience uh, by providing um, uh, a record of operations you've performed. Uh, obviously, references are important. Uh, and it's considered to be a relatively you know, nice honor to have that FACS after your name. And it's something that I saw when I was pursuing surgery of the profession. Uh, I was very happy and very honored to have been, been accepted. And I've been quietly practicing and, and had FACS after my name for the past 35 years. Um, this kind of began in... Uh, actually, 2019 or thereabouts. It was definitely pre-COVID, uh, pre-George Floyd. I mean, two big watershed uh, uh, events in recent history. Um, and I became aware of a trend um, toward uh, promoting something other than excellence in surgery within the American College of Surgeons. Um, it's a 113-year-old organization. It's always been dedicated to excellence in surgery. Um, the mission statement for the ACS is to serve all with skill and fidelity. And you can also substitute the word trust for fidelity. Uh, so it's an all-encompassing um, mission statement that states that, you know, we basically are here to serve all people to the best of our ability. Uh, and what I saw was the beginning of a push to substitute other things ahead of excellence. And um, there was a lecture given back around 2019 uh, by a pediatrician from Harvard invited to address their, uh, the ACS uh, Clinical Congress. And her, um, her title of her talk was, I believe I've got it right, uh, A Path Toward Diversity, Excellence, and Inclusion. Of course, today, the E stands for equity, not excellence. But the, the title of the talk was a, a Path to Diversity, Excellence, and Inclusion. And I thought that's an interesting topic. And I read the transcript word for word of her, her speech. Um, excellence never appeared in the speech throughout the entire, it was ever mentioned other than the title. It was all about diversity. And so I uh, placed a comment uh, in, the FA, in the ACS bulletin um, that uh, was uh, expressing concern about what I saw with an emphasis on diversity uh, over excellence, which I felt needs to be primary in something as important as a practice of surgery. And, you know, it, it felt good to put the comment in. It didn't result in any kind of feedback. Um, only four surgeons commented that I know of. Mine was by far the longest comment. Uh, and things went along that way, but that's that kind of sparked an interest in me to investigate this further. So I began to investigate this issue of DEI and, and as it was slowly becoming more and more uh, recognized in, in areas of, of our country. Um, and then what happened was George Floyd was killed. Uh, and of course, uh, as anyone who was paying any attention to the news uh, knows, that sparked a stampede. I mean, just an avalanche 
of of movement um, by everybody, every institution, every organization uh, couldn't move fast enough to declare themselves on board with the idea that the U.S. is systemically racist and we have to make radical changes in this country to to fight that. Um, and the ACS was no different. Their leadership uh, within weeks of the George Floyd uh, killing uh, had assembled the task force on racism. That task force was there to study it. And this is in their own words, uh, you know, to deal with the problem of structural racism in the ACS. It wasn't whether there was racism. It was it's there and we have to deal with it. So there was no question. And yet at no time then or since have they ever provided any evidence for this so-called racism. The task force came out with their recommendations um, in uh, 2021. And uh, that uh, the recommendation for that, uh, for changes, pardon me, I got a little bit of a tickle in my throat. Mm -hmm. uh, the recommendation for changes included a lot of, a lot of radical steps. One was to adopt anti-racism and the values of the ACS. Anti-racism is a uh, an idea, an ideology, call it what you will. Some say it's a religion um, that was originated by Ibram Kendi, who who made it pretty much uh, um, common knowledge in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Um, and the ACS wanted to adopt that in the value of the colleges. And they made other changes. They opened up a whole new department of diversity, uh, hired a clinical director and an executive director, and began to install all sorts of initiatives, uh, teaching uh, their staff and, and, and the leadership about microaggressions, which anyone who's read about microaggressions knows that anything can be a microaggression. If I, mm -hmm. if I simply, you know, someone takes anything I say uh, in, in a manner which it may not be even intended uh, and it offends them, that's a microaggression and that's considered to be violence. And we have to be, you know, inculcated against, uh, against doing these things. So they had all these initiatives, all these things, and, and I, I saw this and, and was really troubled by it. Um, I'm a writer. I've written columns, medical columns, for over 25 years for the newspaper and magazines. Um, and I wrote a long letter to the president-elect of the ACS, and I expressed my concerns for all these things. And the, the premise of my letter was that if this particular path continued, I could not see my way to staying in the ACS as a fellow because I really uh, objected to being called racist myself and having the organization that I've always aspired to and been proud to be a member of racist as well. Uh, and they went so far, it wasn't even, it wasn't even that that was the worst of it. The worst of it was they would make um, allegations like black patients don't do as well if their surgeon is white. Hmm. And they would do better if they are having surgery by black surgeons, which, you know, if, if you understand how much trust matters in, in medical care, especially between a surgeon and patient, I can't think of a more toxic thing you could say or something that would more create distrust uh, between patients and surgeons. Um, so I wrote this letter. I uh, never got a response to it. And uh, so I decided to go to the ACS discussion forums. Uh, like a lot of organizations, they have a community board where you can post comments and, and begin discussions. Um, and I posted one on the General Surgery Forum, which is the largest forum in the ACS. And I basically, again, restated my, my objection to the path of the ACS and calling us racists and installing DEI. And said that I, if this continued, I couldn't see my way to be, you know, to staying a fellow. Well, that particular post led to a comment thread that ran for over four months. Um, nearly a thousand comments, uh, the most ever for any uh, comment post in the history of the ACS. Uh, it actually had to be transferred over to a second uh, page because it was slowing the system down so much. And I, I want to say 125. Uh, individual surgeons commented on that. It was unheard of, the, the volume on that. Well, two-thirds of them agreed with me. Hmm. Uh, One-third were either ambivalent or disagreed. Um, and that comment thread ran for a long... And as you can imagine, if you've ever been around surgeons, uh, we tend to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty strong, opinionated people. We're not shy about expressing opinions. Uh, uh, and, you know, I would say that uh, the discussion was that sometimes spirited. 
Uh, but in no time, I don't think anybody felt like they were being bullied or harassed or anything like that. So a lot of these things kind of run their natural life in this comment thread ran its natural course. There wasn't really much more to say after a while. And uh, I kind of moved away from it. And as I was wondering what next, uh, I was actually approached uh, by the leadership of the ACS. The, the ACS is run by a 23 member board of regents. And they approached me and said, we'd like to discuss this with you. So somehow I made an impression and they felt they needed to reach out. And so <clears throat> they uh, allowed me to invite a colleague of mine to come on this discuss this uh, this Zoom call, if you will, uh, which was in uh, March of two thousand and twenty two, yeah, two thousand and twenty two. Um, there were five people on the Zoom call. They included one of the Board of Regents, an older surgeon. Uh, they included the new uh, Director of Diversity, also a surgeon. Uh, included the General Secretary of the ACS, and myself, and a colleague who happened to be um, a black female surgeon that had been very supportive. She's a friend of mine in our community and was very supportive of me. We had a very nice Zoom call. I mean, this was a, a civil discussion. Uh, we all expressed our opinions and, and our concerns. Um, I would say that there was no consensus reached. There was no no agreements that, oh, you're right, or, or, or do this. Or, but, but there was, there was I, I felt, um, a, a very collegial uh, uh, nature to the conversation, and I came away from it very encouraged. Mm. And I even sent emails to all the people that participated, thanking them for this and expressing my optimism that this would spark some discussion in the ACS and whatnot. Well, it wasn't but a few weeks later <clears throat> that I couldn't get on the discussion forums. I couldn't access them. And after two weeks of trying, thinking that maybe it was a glitch in the system, I contacted the general secretary, uh, Dr. Tyler Hughes, uh, who is now the vice president elect of the ACS. I said, you know, Tyler, why can't I get on the discussion forums? What's going on? And that's when I was first informed that I had been banned. Uh, he said, I've been banned for life. I cannot engage anymore with surgeons on the discussion forums. Um, and uh, I asked why. And the reason I was given was that I was continuously disrespectful and that I was posting non-clinical material on the clinical forums. Uh, one thing they had done after our Zoom call was to change the rules of the discussion forums to prohibit any non-clinical discussions on the clinical forums. The forum that my comment thread was on was a general surgery forum. And so supposedly we weren't supposed to post anything about diversity there. What's really hypocritical about that is that one of the claims is that uh, this issue of diversity and racism in the ACS is the cause of discrepancies in the outcomes of surgery. Mm -hmm. So that's a direct clinical issue, and I don't see how you can separate the two. But be that as it may, I asked for examples. I said, well, show me an example. Give me, a, give me one example of my disrespectful comments or an example of my inappropriate uh, comments. And I've asked for that multiple times and never gotten anything. So I was I was banned. And what's interesting is I can see from their perspective why they might ban me, because I think I was creating a lot of discussion and um, uh, and I don't think they liked the questioning their their direction. Um, and I can see where they they might see that banning me from the discussion forums would be probably a good thing to do. Um, but they also banned me from access to the members directory which I have a perfect right to as a, as a fellow in the ACS, which I still am, by the way. I wasn't mm -hmm. expelled or anything. And uh, also from my own private mailbox. I can't even access my private mailbox. And the ban is a lifetime ban. It wasn't a ban for six months or a year. Or, it was a lifetime ban, which I would say is, seems a bit excessive to me. Well, I made every effort within the ACS to deal with this. I appealed to the Board of Regents. That was denied. Uh, I was told I received due process. Um, and the ACS, like all organizations, has um, bylaws by which the ACS is run. So they have rules and regulations. They have very, very specific rules for how they discipline uh, fellows in the ACS. If you're misbehaving in some way or, or brought before the, the attention of the, the, the leadership uh, for something, you're supposed to submit that to the Central Judiciary Committee, which in turn investigates. And if they feel that there's justification uh, for you know, the allegation and they feel that some discipline is, is appropriate, 
they then determined the discipline and turned it back over to the Board of Regents to, to carry that out. But there is supposed to be a due process where the, the surgeon is supposed to be informed that they are being investigated. Um, they are supposed to be allowed an opportunity to have a hearing to present their side of thing and hear what the, the accusations are and to present their defense. And then before any kind of uh, a punishment is uh, uh, put into place, uh, they're to be given or they're informed ahead of time to know that this is coming. None of that took place. Um, the the director of the Judiciary Committee told me that my ban was never presented to the committee. Hmm. And what's really interesting um, uh, and really, really amazing is that when I asked him for, I said, I would like a hearing. And his response was, well, you never came before our committee. So this lifetime ban of yours is not strictly speaking, a disciplinary action. So you don't deserve a hearing. And that was the end of my efforts to work within the ACS, at which time I said, okay, I need to go public with this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so basically I started to write, which is what I probably do the best. Um, was very fortunate in 2022 that the Wall Street Journal published a, a piece of mine called Critical Race Theory is Bad Medicine. Mm -hmm. um, I, that received some some significant exposure um, in the course of all this this uh, activity. Um, I joined two organizations. Um, are you familiar with Do No Harm? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm a senior fellow in Do No Harm. And are you familiar with Fair? F A I R. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a, a founding fellow of Fair in Medicine, which is kind of an offshoot mm -hmm. of, of Fair, the kind of the medical offshoot of Fair. Uh, and they've been very, very helpful with me in, 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 in number one, support, because it gets kind of lonely out there. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had a couple of uh, articles uh, published in National Review, um, uh, City Journal, and then just this past, uh, uh, what was it? Oh, it's just yesterday. <laughs> it seems like longer than that. But um, yesterday I had an article published in the Washington Examiner, which uh, uh, all of it relates to not just the ban, but also what's happening in surgery. <laughs> Excuse me. So mm -hmm. let me just quickly, and I'll, and I'll, I'll be finished in a second mm -hmm. here. I know this is probably going a long time. Um, I've been trying to, to, to focus on not just my objection to this, but also why this is not a good thing. Okay. You know, I have to have some justification for, for why. And as I become more and more, um, familiar with, knowledgeable about uh, DEI and what's going on with DEI, I realized that it is tremendously impacting the quality of surgery. And I, I know this because uh, I don't think there's an exception uh, to this, that I've had conversations with multiple surgeons of, of my generation. You know, I'm nearing the end of my career. I was trained back in the 1970s and 80s. Um, and all of us look around and see that the quality of surgeons coming out of training programs today is not nearly what it should be. A lot of young surgeons come out of training not ready to practice. I mean, they basically need a, another year or more of apprenticeship behind a experienced surgeon before they're, you can unleash them on society. Um, and that's that should not be. I mean, if you can't train a surgeon in a residency, either your, your residency is too short or it's inadequate or you're getting bad, you know, bad residents. And uh, across the board in, in medicine, not just in academia, but in medicine specifically, uh, there's been a continual lowering of the bar to where in order to, uh, to try to encourage more diversity and bring up more <clears throat> minorities, they have been lowering the standards. In other words, nowadays, you know, you don't have to, to uh, even take the medical college aptitude test to get into medical school. Uh, sufficient uh, is a, a uh, uh, essay about your lived experience and what you've done to promote DEI and, and whatnot, and, and you can get into medical school with grades that would never, ever qualify you to do so otherwise. And they're even denying, you know, they're denying highly qualified candidates. Uh, the, the particular group that's being especially um, discriminated against is Asians mm -hmm. that have traditionally done very well in the STEM fields and in medicine especially. Uh, and they're not getting into medical school because they're making room for these diversity uh, selections. Uh, so what's happening is you have a lot of surgeons coming out that aren't qualified to practice. Um, and now I've actually had some conversations with, with surgeons that are in training today 
uh, that tell me really, really troubling things about what's happening in residencies. Uh, among them are residents not getting sufficient surgical experience in their residency program, um, surgeons not helping the surgeons that they are supposed to be training to actually learn how to operate. In other words, in a residency, there's there's greater responsibility, starting with your internship and going up to when you become a chief resident, where along the way, you get more and more freedom to operate. In mm -hmm. the beginning, they basically, they basically hold your hands while you're doing surgery. Toward the end, you're actually teaching residents behind you, just mm -hmm. as you would if you were a full-fledged surgeon. Um, these residents today are not getting that experience. Um, and some of these programs are even allowing residents to list as part of the surgical experience operations that they simply observe, not even scrubbed in wow. or assisted, wow. but simply observed. And those are going into the surgical logs that are used by the credentialing organizations like the American Board of Surgery and the American Board of Plastic Surgery to qualify a surgeon to sit for board certification. Um, it's really, really scary. Uh, I'm not exaggerating when I say that I'm at a point now where I would advise people to be very careful about going to a surgeon who's less than 40 years old. I would say if you're going to someone in their 30s uh, who trained in this more recent period of time, uh, be darn sure that that person is highly qualified and vet them extremely carefully. Don't just assume that because they're, they're residency trained and board certified that they are qualified to be doing what they're doing. So today, I'm still banned. Um, I've had success with getting the word out. Uh, hopefully, you know, you inviting me here uh, is going to further that effort to get the word out. I don't have any hope of ever getting back my privileges in the ACS. I think I'm basically persona non grata on the ACS now. But what I'm shooting for today is accountability mm -hmm. um, for the surgeon, the leadership to basically fess up to what they're doing. Uh, I would like them to stop doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and if I go to my ultimate goal, uh, having seen what happened to the university presidents recently with Claudine Gay and, and uh, Mary, um, oh, what was from the, the uh, UPenn um, president, uh, I would like to see a turnover in the ACS leadership. I'd like to see them deposed by the membership and new leadership installed and get back on track to, to fulfill the mission of the ACS, which is to promote excellence in surgery, and that should be primary. Wow, so you've really watched this organization go from a respected and um, highly esteemed organization that, that, as you say, promoted excellence to in just a very short time, really going undergoing some significant changes. You said that this really started to come into your awareness in 2019. Thereabouts, and, yes. And so it's quite a change just in a few <clears throat> short years. And the the ACS, forgive me if you if you said this, this is there's so there's the professional body, but there's also the the educational institutions. And so are those are two separate things that are running parallel to one another. So there's the problem within the professional network body as well as in the educational institutions. Part that that's true. That what the ACS does, they have a number of different what they call pillars mm -hmm. uh, of the ACS: uh, uh, community outreach, uh, education is a big one, mm -hmm. um, and so they have a lot to do with uh, residency training programs in surgery, and, and this okay. includes not just general but in all specialties. Uh, pretty much anybody that's a surgical specialist can become a a fellow in the ACS. I'm one as a plastic surgeon. Uh, you could be your ENT ophthalmology and also be FACS. Um, so uh, they have, you know, for example, they promote, uh, they've been very, very big in trauma care. Mm -hmm. uh, the ACS has really been uh, on the forefront of uh, advances in trauma care to improve the, you know, the outcomes of, of treating uh, injured uh, individuals. Uh, and that's been really, really huge. They've also been big in um, discussing things like um, uh gun control. Now, you can mm -hmm. argue whether the ACS has any role to play in gun control, but I guess the idea is because guns shoot people that, you know, the ACS should have some say because we're the guys that are called to take care of the gunshots mm -hmm. in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they also have a number of other initiatives and, and you know, they have, uh, they provide for grants uh, for <clears throat> fellowships for surgeons that have finished training to go and, and observe other countries and other places. 
um, ultimately, it all comes down to promoting excellence, mm-hmm. uh, in, empowering surgeons to be the best they can be, mm-hmm. to teach them uh, as much as, as they need to, to provide excellent care, and also to, to oversee uh, all this goes back to the patient, who is ultimately the, the, the primary reason for our being is to take care of our patients. <clears throat> what they have done is they've taken the, 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 uh, the focus mm-hmm. from the individual patient in front of us, and they put that focus on identity groups. So mm-hmm. now when we see a patient, we're supposed to see that patient as a black mm-hmm. or as a Hispanic or mm-hmm. as a, um, a f- you know, female patient mm-hmm. as a, mm-hmm. you know and and you know obviously those things are factors there's mm-hmm. there's things that i look at uh when i see a patient uh who has black for example um just as a, a quick example is that you know very few non-blacks are going to be um uh, shown to have anything to do with sickle cell anemia where it's not <clears throat> this is very mm-hmm. uh not prevalent but it's it's very well known that some blacks carry the gene and that can cause problems with surgery mm-hmm. and so forth so to say you don't take race into account but mm-hmm. you're dealing with a patient in front of you you're not dealing with an abstract member of an identity group that mm-hmm. you have to somehow treat differently because of that. I mean, we treat each patient as an individual, not as part of a big group. Mm -hmm. And that's a complete counter to the tradition of medicine as a whole, which going back to ancient times, uh, you know, the Hippocratic Oath is something that almost all medical students today still take or some version of it. Mm -hmm. And that oath focuses on, you know, the the physician and the patient, not the physician in some group. I mean, that's, that's our, our focus. Mm -hmm. And, uh, What's happened is we've taken our eyes off of that and gone to the group focus. And I think that's been a terribly negative thing for for everything, like I said earlier, from trust in medicine to even degrading the quality of care. Because we're asking mm-hmm. young surgeons are not getting sufficient time to be trained adequately. And we're mm-hmm. throwing at them an entire new curriculum that includes all the social justice material. They have mm-hmm. to be taking courses. And you know DEI and and microaggressions and anti-racism and mm-hmm. and uh, colonialism and, and all this other crazy stuff that has nothing to do with patient care. Mm-hmm. Um, the DEI just introduced uh, at the end of this past year an incredibly huge comprehensive toolkit called the DEI toolkit. Is the the DEI toolkit is intended for surgeons to use to help them implement anti-racism. And DEI, and they're very specific about that. They're not mm. mincing words. They're not hiding behind any kind of euphemism. They're promoting anti-racism and DEI, and and providing this toolbox for or toolkit for patient for excuse me for surgeons mm-hmm. uh, to study and embrace and utilize in their their practices. And if you look at what the toolkit includes, I mean, just reading through it, doing nothing else, would take the better part of an afternoon mm-hmm. or a day. But then if you start implementing these things. I don't know where you're going to find the time. And if you got a young resident who's supposed to be studying surgery and taking care of patients, and you make them take time away from their patient care responsibilities to attend courses in microaggressions, I don't see how that helps quality of surgery. And I, I think there's a lot of evidence to be to be uh, found that it does the exact opposite of that. Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds like if we can be generous, we can call this DEI or, or CRT or whatever, we can call it a social philosophy. But the social philosophy has taken hold and been implemented really quickly. And so you went, it seems like kind of a shell game they were playing when they were, you You talk about that initial presentation that you watched where she called it diversity, excellence, and inclusion. So she's still sort of folding in the old <clears throat> language and, and bringing this alongside that. And then after that, they're starting these anti-racist uh, task force initiatives to, to find racism. And then as you started to try to have a conversation about this, and you found that a lot of people really did want to engage with this topic, you had a bunch of people in that forum um, engaging with this. And most of them sounds like they were sharing your concerns the way that you were cut off. I counted the numbers. It was, it was clearly two thirds were, were actually, uh, in, you know, in agreement with with you. Yeah. What was really interesting is how many were clueless until until they started to read more about this. This was going on. There were people who were just sort of, uh, just 
sort of taking it in and not really asking too many questions about it. And so right. you and other people having that engagement and that conversation was bringing this issue up and ha- and and offering them a chance to really look at this and say, do I agree with this or not? So you're were, you were offering an educational opportunity to people who might have otherwise just kind of been too busy to pay attention. And the way that you were cut off from doing that so completely cut off from not only engaging in the forum, but also cut off from the directory in your email means that you can't use that directory to reach out and have even one-on-one conversations. Absolutely not. With your fellows. My my constant refrain throughout that four month period where that thread was running was number one, I wanted the ACS at a minimum to acknowledge what they were doing, which was Mm -hmm. obvious. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things they did while denying that they were embracing anti-racism and DEI, one of the things they did was to invite a keynote speaker to their uh, leadership retreat on diversity. And that speaker was Abram Kendi, who, if you know anything about Abram mm-hmm. Kendi, you know, he commands a fee of twenty to $30,000 for an hour of his time. Um, and um, uh, right now he's kind of under under the microscope because of mismanagement of mm-hmm. millions of dollars in his mm-hmm. Center for Anti-Racism Research, and they would not they would not be willing to say, yeah, we're, we're doing that. They kept saying things like, well, our DEI is not the same as the DEI you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And I could never get anybody to tell me how what the difference was. Um, and my constant refrain was, why don't we get some other perspectives? There are so many Black intellectuals that... Mm-hmm have so much more intellectual horsepower than Kendi does yeah. to offer a different perspective, not just look at one perspective. Why don't we invite others to this diversity leadership retreat? And why aren't we looking at other ways of addressing this issue? And why is the membership not being engaged in these proposed radical changes? I mean, these changes to the addition of the Department of Diversity and additional hires, you know, which come from the dues that we pay as, as members. None of this was done with any engagement uh, mm-hmm. or vote, for that matter, by the membership. So it was, you know, uh, I guess I just became too much of a bother and, mm-hmm. and too annoying, and I had to be slapped down. Mm-hmm. And this was, they had the means to do it, and that's exactly what they did. Mm-hmm. Um, you pointed out with, that it was highly hypocritical the way that they did that by saying that you couldn't address non-clinical matters in these in these <clears throat> Uh, these particular forums, but they were clearly the ones that were bringing these issues into the clinical sphere. And you were talking Absol- about the clinical implications of these policies. Absolutely. One of the things that the, that uh, if you have access to and you look at the, the DEI toolkit, mm-hmm. um, they, they list in there as a reference, a study that purported to show that um, black babies will do better if their doctor, if the mother's uh, obstetrician is black. Um, And uh, that study has been criticized and shown to be terribly flawed. I mean, it was called catastrophically flawed uh, by one reviewer, but but they're still using that. Yeah, they use that as a justification Mm -hmm. for this claim that, you know, white surgeons don't treat black patients as well as black surgeons do. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, I, I... the idea that that I and my fellow surgeons, because we are white, we are irretrievably, irredeemably, mm-hmm. if you will, uh, racist, and we just can't help it. You know, we don't even know how racist we are because we're, you know, we're too white to know that. Uh, it's just to see this in surgery is so discouraging. I mean, I feel like I'm leaving a profession that I've loved and, and, and practiced for. Uh, I've been in surgery, including general surgery, for almost 45 years. Mm-hmm. And to be where it is today uh, is just absolutely appalling. And I keep thinking something has to change. I'm, I'm just hoping that you know my little bit will help to mm-hmm. turn the tide. I'm seeing some some positive changes. Just the um, resignations of McGill, it was McGill mm-hmm. at Penn mm-hmm. and Gay at Harvard, uh, resigning was you know a, a big encouraging moment mm-hmm. when people started to recognize how bad. This is in academic institutions. Maybe they can do a little bit here. The well, uh, I, the ACS, yeah, the ACS has eighty four thousand mm-hmm. surgeon members. I mean, I'm one out of eighty four thousand. I mean, it's a huge organization, the largest in the world, by far the oldest, and until recently the most respected. And I'm not 
here trying to, you know, I'm not David trying to take down Goliath. Mm -hmm. That's not my intent. Mm -hmm. My intent is to try to restore some sense of the, the right priorities mm -hmm. in the ACS. You know, if we have racism, let's see where it is and let's get take care of it. Mm -hmm. But show us where it is. Don't just yeah. claim it's there and institute all these things that, that have been really controversial mm -hmm. uh, to deal with supposed racism. And then um, restrict the members' abilities to have conversations about these policies and to di and to discuss them. And that's the other thing is, you know, when you start seeing professional organizations mm -hmm. shutting down conversations, mm -hmm. you know, uh, silencing dissent, canceling members, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, there's something very wrong about that. That right there tells you that there's a problem, that whatever is being promoted that is leading to this type of cancellation, there's something very wrong with that if it can't be spoken about openly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when they are talking about the, that when they have this anti-racism task force that comes in and looks, and you said that on the basis of a, of a controversial study that's been, uh, that, that's been demonstrated to have some serious flaws, they claim that black babies do better when their mothers are treated by black doctors. Um, also, you mentioned that they talked about black patients in general not doing as well with white surgeons. Did they have any did did they have any evidence for this and did they have any practical steps for for helping people to get better outcomes? They keep trying to justify these claims by mm -hmm. citing studies. And I don't know that there's an exception to this. I, I can't claim to have a knowledge of every study out there that deals with this issue, but everyone that's been put out there and promoted to justify the claim that blacks do better with their own surgeons of their own race, <clears throat> they're always flawed. They're always mm -hmm. biased. They're always flawed. And what they come out looking like is basically a political uh, exercise mm -hmm. to try to justify a conclusion that's already been come to. Um, they've concluded the problem is there, and the study is designed simply to support that conclusion. It's not, well, is there racism and how do we ferret it out? Mm -hmm. It's, oh, there's racism and here's a study that that demonstrates that. Um, there's been no no study. I, I would venture to say there's yet to have been a study coming out that's been reviewed, what they call peer review by other you know researchers and other surgeons that has been substantiated that shows that um, what they call racial um, uh, correlation or racial something or other, you know, having having uh, patients and doctors of the same ethnicity or race, that that makes any difference whatsoever in the outcome of surgery. I, I, I'm like every other surgeon. I've treated patients of every ethnicity, you know, Asian, Hispanic, Black, um, uh, you know, what a dim trans, view of you know, you name beings. it. I mean, <laughs> Uh, and and yeah. to say that we have yeah. some kind of unconscious yeah. bias that prevents us from providing the best care to all but those of our own race, mm -hmm. uh, I can't even wrap my mind around why you would want to put that idea out unless you had absolute proof. Well, and if that were the case, that. you would think that you'd be able to validate that very easily with data. It should be very easy to validate. And so yeah. far, it has not been. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, when you talk about the the quality of younger, more recently trained surgeons as compared with the older cohort, that is really concerning. And I that's the same trend that I have been that I and many others have been calling out in psychology and counseling. It's the same trend. You know, this is one of the pieces of advice a lot of people will give is to look very carefully if you're going to select a counselor who's under a certain age or has been trained in the past several years, because there's a high chance that a lot of their training has been informed by some of these ideologies. But when it comes to surgery, we're talking about something when when you started the conversation, you said you're a nobody. And I would say that you're at, that you're not at all. You're somebody who has a highly critical set of skills that has changed so much for human beings changes lives all the time. The the need for us to have skilled and qualified surgeons. I just can't think of a worse place for this kind of ideology to take hold and change the quality of what people 
can expect when when they're in a position to require surgery. And you're, that's extremely you're right concerning. About it being, yeah, it's in other fields. You're exactly right about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, your recent guest, uh, and the, the reason why we're speaking today is because of uh, Rick McCarthy, who you interviewed a while back, mm -hmm. uh, reaching out to me. He apparently read one of my the articles that came out and reached out to me. And actually, I, I watched your interview with him, um, mm -hmm. and he's ex seen the exact same thing in his area of, of family therapy, where the newer uh, therapists coming out. Are, are, you know, they're not just doing therapy, they're doing social justice, they're doing, mm -hmm. you know, uh, trying to find some way to, to right past wrongs and, and to account for uh, oppressed oppressor, you know, narratives in the, the lives of their, of their patients, and, and mm -hmm. as opposed to dealing with each individual uh, as exactly that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, sir. So it's tough. Uh, I'm I'm getting to an age where I think it's a foregone conclusion that my wife and I, at some point in time, we're going to come into the the point where we're going to need medical care. We're lucky to be very healthy, <clears throat> but when that happens, uh, I'm concerned about finding a surgeon that I'm going to be confident is going to provide me with the best possible care. Uh, all the surgeons that I've found that I have confidence in are around my age mm. now. What I don't want to do is I don't want to paint every young doctor with the same brush. So mm -hmm. I would say that this is not across the board. Mm -hmm. uh, it is certainly a lot more common than I think it should be. And that's very worrisome. Mm -hmm. I have um, uh, three children. My younger daughter is a physician and her husband's a physician. <clears throat> They're both very, very well trained um, and extremely you know, smart, bright, good at what they do. Mm -hmm. um, and I asked them about some of these things. <laughs> The response was interesting. My daughter graduated in um, around, uh, I think it was class of 2017 from my alma mater, the University of Miami. And she and her husband both said, we're glad that we went to medical school before all this stuff hit mm -hmm. because they weren't having to submit uh, essays on their support for DEI and what they've done to advance the cause mm -hmm. of DEI and, and all these things that, you know, medical uh, medical student. Uh, school applicants today can't even get a foot in the door without unless without they submit some of these, that. these mm -hmm. statements that that basically indicate their support for these things. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the quality is being <coughs> undermined both by lowered standards of admission, which favor identity characteristics over over aptitude and and other standards that you'd be assessing an applicant by. And also by the heavy inclusion of this DEI, I guess, curricula in place of stuff that these young doctors really shouldn't be focusing on. Yeah, there, there has to be something has to give. You can't keep yeah. adding without taking something away. Mm -hmm. So at some point in time, you're going to have to start reducing, you know, the the time and, and, and intensity of courses in physiology and pharmacology and microbiology and, and biochemistry and, and, you know, all these things that are part of the, the fund of knowledge that mm -hmm. someone has to have. And even today, even though what I do is relatively specialized, I don't think a week goes by. I don't find myself calling back on something that I learned in medical school, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. some drug or some illness that, that pops up in a patient of mine. And I have at least some basic and you know information about that because I was exposed to it. Mm -hmm. If I had spent you know hours upon hours and a semester or more on these other uh, issues, uh, I don't think that would have happened. Mm -hmm. And I think we're seeing that for sure. Um, you mentioned that you're encouraged by some of these recent high level resignations, and that that it sounds like you have hope that there's possibility to reform the ACS. Is there also any talk of building a, uh, alternative organizations or is, is there an alternative organization that's focusing on these issues or do you feel like you're really kind of a lone voice right now? There is talk. In fact, I've had some people suggest to me because I've got some visibility by my the exposure I've had um, in my writings uh, that have suggested, why don't we just go off and start our own surgical organization that replaces the ACS. And mm -hmm. that's a great idea. Um, tremendously labor intensive. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't even know how to begin doing something like that. 
and um, you know, you're reinventing the wheel in a sense. That is happening. I don't know if you're familiar with the University of Austin in Texas. Oh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so I mean, people are doing that. They're mm -hmm. they're saying, okay, these these institutions are they're not reformable. They're, they're irredeemable, and we've had to simply write them off and move on and start mm -hmm. our own. Mm -hmm. That may happen. <clears throat> There's an American, um, oh gosh, American Academy of Physicians or American something of physicians that I think was started as a response to, in general, in medicine, generally speaking, to the AMA, which AMA is. is an organization that has lost all credibility and all legitimacy. <clears throat> They're basically they, their membership amounts to 15, 16% of all physicians. You know, they, they sound like a very powerful organization that represents doctors, but they only exist because they have a monopoly hmm. on certain things that gives them a source of revenue. So they don't depend on dues from, from members. Mm -hmm. um, but there are organizations that have, that have been developed to try to provide physicians with an alternative. Uh, to you know things like the AMA, that hasn't happened so far with respect to the ACS. Could it in the future possibly? Um, I'm doing things today I never imagined. I mean, this conversation with you—if you told me that you know a year and a half ago that I would be in the position that I'm in, having these conversations with people—I would have said you're nuts. There's no way. But I am very close to retirement. I'm going to be retiring from my practice. <coughs> Excuse me. In uh, about eight months. And that's going to open a pretty much, you know, a, a wide uh, amount of uh, space and time for me mm -hmm. to do other things. So I wouldn't discount that. Mm -hmm. um, if you want to take a moment and grab a glass of water to finish. I should have gotten that. Just give me one second. Yeah, Let me do that. Totally. I'll edit this chunk out. My husband is a good editor. He'll edit it out for me. So again, if we can be generous, we could call Ibram Kendi a social philosopher and this DEI, CRT stuff, a social philosophy. But I think that would be generous, yes. Yes, yeah, just trying to be, use neutral kind of framing. So in your, in your career, have you ever seen anything else like this where a social philosophy has come in and made such an impact and changed so much about the way things are being done? No. I, I can say, I can say no, yeah. The, the only thing that would be remotely like that would be the periodic rise of, of, of you know, individuals or groups promoting socialist ideas, mm -hmm. trying to to <clears throat> say that capitalism is not working or it's a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And we need to become, you know, more socialist, mm -hmm. uh, democratic socialists or mm -hmm. you name it. And that seems like that's something like this cultural. That's more culture wide and not so much specific to <clears throat> medicine and being adopted by by the medical field this way. So this is something that's completely new. This is this is completely, completely different than anything I've ever seen. I mean, to, to say, to look at where we are today in medicine is just mm -hmm. shocking. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I began to learn about when I started looking at this was critical race theory. I had never even heard of it, never even heard of the term. And that basically is an offshoot of critical theory, which is something which came out of Germany in the 1930s. And the, my my understanding of it is not a not a scholar, not an academician, is basically it's, it's viewing all of history as a power struggle between the oppressor and the oppressed. You know, Karl Marx did it with uh, class struggle. Um, you know, economics, uh, the bourgeois versus the proletariat, and, and whatnot. And critical race theory simply, you know, took that premise and made it racial. Mm -hmm. So now it's the oppression of the whites against the non-whites. Mm -hmm. So everything is predicated on this class struggle and the efforts by the oppressor class, i.e. the whites, um, to, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting, got to get this off of here. Um, Do you have a sense of why this would have been so attractive and why this has been implemented in the, in the field of medicine and surgery? Why this? And, and, and when it's so clearly you know, you're able to see and your colleagues are able to see that it's causing, it's impacting the quality of care. And there are real concerns about it. Why was this not more carefully evaluated and and given the green light to go ahead and, and take over so much of the way things are being done? I think it's been, it's happened so slowly that it's been able to infiltrate 
a lot of the the universities. I think that's where pretty much it was confined for many, many years. Um, critical theory was was kind of an abstract, esoteric uh, thing that was discussed in university. And then it began to come out of that as people that were were learning about that and kind of buy into it began to leave the universities and go out into the society and become, you know, the the movers and shakers, the managers and the bosses and the, the entrepreneurs and so forth. I think they've carried that with them. I think there's a there's a I don't know if you're familiar with Thomas Sowell. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the the answers to your question is that there's there's two kinds of people in the world. Um, there are the people that that basically have what's called a um, the um, oh my gosh I, I, I hate it when I can't catch a word uh, that I really want to grasp and I can't get it there. Uh, but there are the people that um, think that you know people are basically uh, they're naturally good and that if you just put the right circumstances around them, if you build the right society, um, it'll take care of all of, of mankind's problems. They just need to have good governance and they need to have equity. Everyone has to have the same thing. Uh, there'll be nobody that, that's going to be better than anybody else. And you can build this utopian society. But then you have the others who realize that human beings are fallible uh, and that there's nothing that you can ever do that's going to be perfect. And every attempt at utopian society has been not only an unmitigated disaster, but has produced more human misery than more hundreds of millions of deaths going back to Stalin and, and Hitler and Mao and, and all these these other people. Uh, the constrained and unconstrained view of life. That's that's Thomas Sowell. And so his uh, his uh, basic uh, philosophy is that there are no solutions. There are trade-offs that there's, you know, every time that you do something to solve a problem, you have to accept that that's not going to be a perfect solution, that you're going to have to make some some trades and some compromises in order to to adopt that. I think the people that have this idea that we can um, change society in some radical manner tend to be drawn to things like critical race theory uh, because it provides a very simple answer. <clears throat> the answer is it's racism. You know, if we can if we can get rid of racism, we can you know walk off in the sunset singing kumbaya and we're all going to be be happy. But no one ever seems to be able to provide this. Um, uh, a description of what the society will look like. What is the so society like where everyone is the same? Mm -hmm. Where no matter how hard you work or how little you work, you're going to get the same outcome. Everyone gets the same outcome. Um, you know, there the 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 uh, there's no excellence because you know excellence means that someone is is competing and, and ahead of somebody else, and you can't have that. You got to bring. You can't. If you can't bring the 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 mediocre up to the excellent, then you got to bring the excellent down to the mediocre. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's a very very um, attractive premise that you can actually create this utopia. But to do that, you have to dismantle the current society because it's not fixable. You know, whiteness is not fixable. I can't be fixed. Mm -hmm. I have to acknowledge my whiteness and and deal continuously with my anti with my racist uh, tendencies and and practice anti racism in order to, to make this work. Um, it's really interesting when you look at, for example, the word anti-racism, you try to understand what exactly this means. And Ibram Kendi, who actually originated the word, he coined the term, he can't define it. Um, there's an excellent video that I've got on one of my, uh, one of my uh, uh, posts on my website. Um, where he's asked specifically, what is anti-racism? Uh, and he, he gives some weird circular answer. Anti-racism is anti-racist practice that promote anti-racism. And you're thinking, okay, well, sounds great. What does it actually mean? It doesn't mean a darn thing. Yeah. So I don't have a good answer why it's so attractive. I think that there's a lot of bored, educated, bored people mm -hmm. that are resentful, that they have gotten these, these college degrees uh, that they can't do a darn thing with, and they've been indoctrinated throughout their entire uh, educational career that um, they are part of an oppressor or oppressed class, one or the other. I mean, there are people at Harvard that are shouting at how oppressed they are. I mean, it's really interesting when you have people that are in Harvard claiming how oppressed they are. I'm thinking, okay, there's something wrong with this picture. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but it's in a very appealing thing because it's, it provides a simple answer to a very complex problem. Just like the ACS says that the the um, disparities in outcomes of surgery are due to racism. Um, and they provide no proof for that. But there are so many other things, you know, access to health care, you know, cultural issues, you know, societal issues, the breakdown of the, of the nuclear family and the black community, for example. Uh, 80% or more of, of, of black households don't have a father. Uh, the children are being raised in a, in a, in a single parent household. Um, incarceration of blacks. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they're, they're the problems. They have to be dealt with. But the ACS is designed specifically to promote excellence in surgery and to help surgeons treat their patients as well as they can. Mm-hmm. They're not there to be distracted and have their efforts diluted by going off in all these different directions that have nothing to do with, with patient care. And unfortunately, if you try to have that discussion, uh, as I tried to do, you get shut down. This is an incredibly alarming and concerning issue, and I'm glad that you're <clears throat> raising it in such a thoughtful and uh, clear way. Thank you so much for bringing this up to to me, and thank you for sharing it. Is there any, do you have any advice for people who want to take steps to help work on this? Is there anything that people can do or where they, they can go to learn more about what's going on and how they can get involved? I really encourage people to first off, educate themselves. There's lots of books out there. By all means, read Ibram Kendi's book, you know, How to Be Anti-Racist, but don't just read that. Go read something by Thomas Sowell or by, by Glenn Lowry, or by Robert Woodson, or someone that has a different different slant to it and provides an alternative view to, to that one view. And the other is, you know, there's there's definitely strength in numbers. Uh, unity is, is really, really important. Uh, I have not gotten this far by myself without the help of organizations like Do No Harm and FAIR. I would never be at this point today, I don't think. And so I think that's supporting these organizations. And there's there's others out there. Um, 1776 Unites is an organization that was started by Robert Woodson um, in order to counter the lies and the, the historical inaccuracies of the 1619 Project mm. um, that got so much play by the New York Times, but is a complete and total lie. Um, so, yeah, educate yourself. Uh, and to the extent that you can, I mean, not everybody's going to be an, an activist in, in, in doing what I've, you know, surprisingly found myself doing, but uh, support the organizations that are fighting back to the best of your ability. And I'm a firm believer that that it helps to do some writing, write your congressman, tell them mm-hmm. where you stand on these issues. You know, if you think that uh, you're concerned about the medical education system and the quality of doctors coming out of residencies, write and, and and express that concern to your congressman mm-hmm. um you know all there's that we haven't even touched on issues that are in medicine today like the whole gender affirmation thing for for transgender children i mean that's that's another whole you could spend hours on that one uh but yeah uh, educate yourself uh support organizations that are that are aligned with your your beliefs and your opinions and to the extent that you can you know make your your views known uh, to people that do have some ability to do something. Uh, I've seen many times where a letter to congressman actually will produce some results and uh, um, surprisingly, a uh, res- you know, result that you would have expected. And where can people follow you and your work? I have a substack. Uh, it's uh, Richard uh, Bosart, Richard T. Bosart, <clears throat> pardon me, Richard T. Bosart, MD, uh, substack.com. Um that's uh, where I'm doing most of my writing. Uh, that's not going into, you know, actual news outlets. Um, we do have a website. Uh, my practice is Bosart and Marzak uh, Plastic Surgery Associates. And so bosartandmarzak.com is our, our website. Um, and I have a blog on that. And um, so there may be some material on that. Right now, it's, it's primarily my Substack. <clears throat> Well, I'll include those links in the description of this video or on the podcast app as well, so people can follow those. Thank you so much, Dr. Bosart, for sharing this time with me today and for sharing this information. Thank you for having me. I really, truly appreciate it. I hope it's going to get 
be the most popular podcast you've ever done and get exposure all over the place. I hope so too. Thank you.